Please welcome all Rays. They'll discuss showing your work. VCs investing in diversity share their secrets with Pam Costa, CEO of All Rays, Christy Pitts, General Partner, Backstage Capital, and Sarah Kunst, Managing Director, Clio Capital. Hello, thanks for joining us today for showing your work, VCs investing in diversities, share, sharing our secrets. I'm Pam Koska, I'm the CEO of Allraise, and we are a startup nonprofit who is focused exclusively on the mission of accelerating the success of female founders and funders um, to build a more prosperous and equitable future. We focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry every day, and I'm pleased to be joined by Sarah Kunst, the founding and managing director at Clio Capital and Christy. For those of you who don't, and Christy Pitts, um, the early stage investor at Backstage Capital. So for those of you who do not know Sarah, Sarah is the, emerging, uh, the managing director of Clio Capital. She's a contributing editor at Marie Claire Magazine. She's been named a future innovator by Vanity Fair and been recognized for her work in Business Insider as a 30 under 30 woman in tech and top African-American in tech. Forbes 30 under 30 all-star alum and pitch book, top black VC to watch. Sarah, welcome. Thank you. And, Chris and Christy joins us. Um, many of you may know her. She's an early stage investor at Backstage Capital and co-founder of Backstage Studio, where she leads Backstage Global Accelerator Program. In addition to her role leading Accelerator, Christy is a general partner at Backstage Capital she joined Backstage in August of 2017 and went on to assist in sourcing and investing in more than 80 startups led by underrepresented women um, and people of color. Thank you, Christy, for joining us as well. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Well, wonderful. Well, I figure we'll just dive right in. Um, it's great to see both of you again. And let's start with um, the makeup of the industry today. Obviously the numbers, um, when we look at the numbers in venture and the percentage of founders getting um, underrepresented founders, women and people of color getting funding, the statistics aren't great, but it would be great to level set just around when we talk about diversity and inclusivity in the industry, what does that really mean? Let's get a common definition for the, the conversation going forward. Sarah, do you wanna handle that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's obvious, right? Uh, we we want uh, the people who are funding and building our tech uh, to be as diverse as the world we live in. And right now we're doing a really bad job at it. And Christy, maybe you can also get us started off with, there's a lot of myths out there about why tech looks the way it does, which is predominantly mm -hmm. white and male today. And so let's start with um, you, Christy, and then we'll move over to you, Sarah. Let's debunk some of the myths about how, why it's so hard to diversify uh, the venture industry and why it's so hard to invest in diverse founders, because you both have great track records that show that that's not true. What are some of the myths sure. that you'd like to blow up? Yeah. So can we um, can we just like throw out two things right away? One is um, that investing in diverse founders or support, supporting underrepresented people is um quote unquote, lowering the bar. And the second is that there's a pipeline problem. Um, for the record, there are less white people on this planet than people of color. And so um, the truth is that the minority population on the planet is white people. And um, in the US, that is the case for people under the age of 18. Uh, when it comes to other statistics, uh, women manage the majority of the wealth in the US. Um, and economic growth is coming from quote unquote underrepresented groups. And so at Backstage, we use the term underestimated instead of underrepresented because we feel it's more reflective of the reality. And when it comes to um, these things like pipe, like the quote unquote pipeline problem, um, that's really just an excuse that people use um, when you put a job rec out there or when you look at your deal flow and you only see um, a very one specific demographic coming through that process, that's a reflection of you and your process. That is not a reflection of the talent that is out there or the opportunity that is out there. And if you're an investor, um, you're quite literally leaving dollars on the table by not diversifying your outreach process, um, reducing the uh, barriers to introductions that you have at your firm and really looking high, like 
far and wide <laughs> for opportunity to, in, to invest in more different kinds of founders. Sarah, is there anything you want to build on, on what um, Christy just shared? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really aware of kind of what the myths are because I, I spend my time focused on investing and making money and we know that diversity drives better returns. So, you know, I guess if, if there are people out there who still don't want to make money, um, it's probably going to be hard for them to stay in their jobs as an investor because the returns are going to be bad. Couldn't agree more. So let's um, pull on that thread a little bit. This, the statistics in the industry today are rather appalling. Um, they're closer to zero or 1% in terms of representation of diversity and inclusion in the venture industry itself and for the amount of founders getting funding. And so those statistics can be disheartening if you are a founder um, out there trying to raise capital. So rather than focus on some of the, I think it's important for us to continue to talk about them, showcase them, shine a spotlight on them and hold the industry accountable for changing itself. At the same time, there are great statistics about the value of diversity and investing in diversity and the better outcomes. And so, Sarah, did you want to talk a little bit about some of those statistics that showcase the power of diversity and what you might have actually seen in the, your portfolio of investments? Yeah, I mean, you know, diversity drives better returns, right? And we know that and it's a fact. And so to me, that's sort of, uh, it's not kind of the main place to focus, right? That's like saying, you know, hey, do you want to explain why gravity works or how it works, right? We're all, you know, on, on Earth and not floating in outer space. So I think to some extent, we can kind of say, okay, great, like, this is a fact. And now, like, let's move on to what do we do about it? And I think it's really interesting, um, you know, almost every time I talk or give a panel, somebody will ask me, um, you know, hey, uh, what advice do you have for, for women um, and people of color and particularly women of color who are often kind of double underrepresented, right? Like even on this panel um, about, you know, about this industry that's not really built for them. And I'm like, no industry is built for us, right? Like, it's not like, you know, male nurses get paid more than female nurses and male teachers get paid more than female teachers. There's not an industry, no matter how sort of historically um, sort of diverse or female it might seem, where women are, are going to be paid fairly or where people of color are going to be, you know, given, um, um, you know, kind of a, an appropriate amount of power um, based on, on their, uh, you know, their, their relevance and in, in presence in the industry. And so if every industry is bad, at least in this one, you know, everybody's five years away from being a billionaire and, and you might be able to like make some real money, get some real power and do something about it. Great. Christine, and, you might even add to that. Yeah. So I did want to add something, which is that um, if you're just starting out or you're looking to break into tech and you look at these statistics, it might feel that the challenges are insurmountable, but that's not the case. And unfortunately, um, the stories have not been told in the past about the people, underrepresented people who have built the tech industry from the very beginning, but they have been here. And once you get into the industry and once you start building your network, you will find that there are very supportive groups that you will belong to, people that will have your back, both to your face and behind your back in rooms advocating for you, um, helping you move to that next level. And so don't let the lack of representation be the thing that discourages you from taking that next step. Uh, we're, do we're trying our best at Backstage to change this narrative. Uh, we do that through with many different initiatives, but the reality is that there are uh, women, there are women of color, there are black women, there are black men, there are LGBTQ folks who have run and will be running billion dollar businesses who, who are managing hundreds of millions of dollars in assets under management. They are out there today. So you could do it too. And we're here to help you. I love those words of um, encouragement backed by action um, that both of you have taken. Are there, you know, here's a great example of just pausing on a moment of inspiration. Is there someone that you would like to highlight from either of your respective investments or portfolios who is kicking it, who people have underestimated um, and that you're backing? Yeah, there are so many. Go ahead, yeah, Sarah. <laughs> there's so many. How do we, how do we find, you know, just, just one or two to start, right? There's obviously people like Arlen Hamilton, um, 
who, you know, uh, co-founded Backstage and alongside uh, Christy and, you know, people like me who run my fund. Um, but, you know, one um, amazing founder in my portfolio, um, who's also the EIR at my my startup or at my fund, um, is Julia Collins. Um, she was a co-founder of Zoom Pizza. She's raised more money um, than any other Black woman in tech in America ever. Um, that was her first company. And then now her second company, um, Planet Zero, is, is also, you know, just a complete game changer. And she's just an amazing force. And the good news is that she's not rare. Um, she's one of, you know, thousands of amazing Black women in America who are starting companies and just killing it. Yeah, to that note, um, there's, there's so many in my portfolio, and I feel like this is always a trap. It's like, what child do you love the most as a parent? Um, but one woman that I'd like to call out is Denise Woodard. She's the CEO of a company called Partake Cookies. You can find Partake at Whole Foods, at Target. And she was just highlighted in Jay-Z's um, recent music video as well. Wonderful. Well, thanks for the, the shout out. Um, I know, Julia, I'm going to go check out this Partake um, Cookies as well. Um, switching tracks just a little bit, the current social environment is clearly applying pressure on the venture industry to be more inclusive. In response, we've seen a lot of venture capitalists creating new separate funds um, to invest in black and brown funders. Is that what the VC industry should be doing? And what work do VCs need to do to truly support underrepresented founders and funders? Christy, over yeah. to you. So, um I think Tiffany from the human utility summed it up best when she said, make the hire and send the wire. If the only thing people do in response to the increased um, focus on social justice is write checks, then I'll be happy because as soon as we can get more capital into the hands of underrepresented founders, the sooner that they can build, there's a lot more work to be done. Please do not um, misunderstand me, but that's the most effective thing that can happen. And the sooner it happens, the better. Sarah? Yeah, you know, I, 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 we tried separate but equal in this country, right? Like, Pam, you were probably born, like, when that was still a thing. It didn't go well, That's right? right. It, it, me a little bit. <laughs> you know, it, we're not that far off, right? So it, it didn't end well. And it's one of those things where, like, how many times do you want to keep trying something that doesn't work and doesn't end well and does not lead to equal outcomes, you know? Like, I don't need a separate water fountain. I don't need a separate venture fund, right? My money is green and I'm I'm writing the same checks, you know? So to me, um, I don't count other people's money, but I will say that when you look historically, right, at how well separate but equal has worked, um, especially when it comes to race, especially in this country, I don't know if I'd be that excited to get back into it. Powerful statement, absolutely. And um, so what do you think the biggest challenges are for VCs and what should they be tackling when it comes to two different things? One, diversifying their own firms, and then the second, diversifying their investments. And so Sarah, let's start with you. I mean, they're related, right? We know that the number one indicator of what a portfolio will look like diversity wise is what the investor looks like. So, um, and what the investment or what the, the team looks like, right, a, a, of the investor. So when you have more women um, on a team at a fund, you invest in more women. And it's not just that the women invest in more women, although they might, it's that the entire team invests in more women. And, you know, with, with racial diversity, um, both for reasons of, of lack of, of reporting as well as just lack of representation, we don't have as robust of data. Um, but in general, what we find is that things that are true around gender are often true around race. And so it's certainly not a, a big leap to say, hey, if you have historically not been good at investing in diversity and you want to start being like slightly less bad at it, um, or God forbid, even good at it, then, you know, go get a diverse team, right? And and be really thoughtful about, you know, what that diversity looks like. A lot of times there's a marked lack of intersectionality where people say, oh, you know, we have we have one, you know, black guy, we have one white woman, 
we're good, we're diverse. Like that's not necessarily a ton of diversity if you have a hundred people right on your team overall. Um, so be really intentional about that. And and when you start to do that, and then at the same, that's sort of the top down of who you're hiring, then the bottom up who you're wiring to, right? To quote Tiffany, um, really is a question of who are you looking at, right? What are the stats of who's coming in um, to pitch you, who's who you're taking meetings from, and then who you end up writing checks to? Um, and then also, what are the deals that you're missing, right? What are deals that are in your wheelhouse that have amazing diverse founders that you're either not looking at in the first place, or you're passing on them, and then they go on to be really successful? And, uh, you know, really get honest about holding yourself accountable. Absolutely great, great advice uh, on accountability and measurement. And so Christy, curious what you, your advice might be to build on that. I think that um, the only thing that I have to add to that is, is to do the work. And so I think that if um, you're currently at a firm where you're lacking diversity on your team and in your portfolio, you may feel that you like, you can't change it, right? Especially if your firm has been around for a few decades. And honestly, you're going to have to pressure yourself to change it because nobody is going to come along and tell you to, and you're not going to be uncomfortable enough to do it on your own until you um, get that lagging indicator of poor financial returns, which is so far out, most likely, that what you do today, you're not necessarily connecting those dots. So um, what I would say is this is a very real problem for you whether or not you recognize it, you can change it. You must take deliberate action because what has worked for you before will not work for you in the future. And what that means, what I mean by deliberate action is diversifying your deal flow consciously, adjusting your um, company evaluation process to ensure that you're not, because of bias, eliminating really solid investment opportunities, diversifying your talent. Um, look, look at your LinkedIn look at who you follow on Twitter, look at who you're emailing with and who you're contacting. What do those people look like and what are their backgrounds? If they are, if it is a homogenous background, then you have constructed for yourself a network where you are leaving people out at your own cost. And so you can take very clear actions today just by measuring, just, just start by measuring your network. Look at, at your network and then start adding diverse people to that network and don't expect those people to teach you anything. Do the work, understand that they're coming from a different perspective, and slowly but surely, you will begin to see change within your firm. I think that's great advice. And the only thing that I always say to people is you don't have to wait for your firm to move. You can move um, your firm and be the, the leading point of the arrow, if you will, for the industry and for your firm, that whether you're an analyst, an associate, a principal, a GP, the work can start with you. Um, as we approach the the final couple minutes, um, would just be curious for each of you to t- take a minute as a call to action to the industry. What do you want to see on this hire and wire um, framework, and what advice do you give to your peers to step in and step forward, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I I think that that advice, right, is pretty self-explanatory, right? Are you hiring? Are you wiring? Um, Race is a complex issue, right, Um, in terms of how we deal with it or don't in this country. But it's really easy to tell, right? I think 100% of people watching this panel probably noticed that I am Black, right? And so it's not hard to tell whether or not you are investing in diverse founders, whether or not you are hiring diverse people. And if you look around your team and everybody is deeply susceptible to a sunburn, you're doing something wrong, right? And so it's not particularly hard to diagnose the problem. And then the question just is, if you're serious about fixing it, go fix it. And if you don't care, admit that you don't care. But, you know, to to Christy's point, don't waste people's time wringing your hands and pretending like you care when it's just something that like truly you don't. Um, And Christy? Uh, yeah, I, the only thing I would say there is um, there are a lot of firms that made public announcements and statements of support over the last few months, and it is time to start showing up and putting your money where your mouth is. That is um, very sage advice. We like to always say at All Raise, what we don't measure doesn't get done. And so it is time to switch from being performative and making statements to being actionable. And again, that action can start with the individual um, 
setting up their meetings, taking more meetings, being intentional about expanding their network. So um, great advice from, from both of you. And I appreciate both of you lending your time and expertise here and continuing to lead the industry through your own actions um, and through your own accountability that you have. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today and um, keep up the, the work and we'll all follow in your footsteps. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you.